right. Happy Earth Day, Eve. And with that, I will pass it off to Katie Blue. Is... I am Thank so you. sorry. I lied, actually. First, I would like to let you know that this meeting is being recorded. Um, so that I would like to share with you. And now with that, I will indeed pass it off to the wonderful Katie Bloom. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, my name is Katie Bloom. I am the political director for Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania. Uh, my role, um, evident by my title, but I also handle our legislative work, our lobby work as well, organization. Um, but for those of you who may not know, uh, Conservation Voters, we are the statewide political voice for the environment. We do whatever we can to elect the most pro-environment legislators that we can. And we do what we can to hold legislators accountable. And the biggest piece of our accountability is you can find at scorecard.conservationpa.org. And that is Pennsylvania's environmental scorecard. And we work on that with our other partners, Sierra Club, Clean Air Council, uh, Penn Environment, and Clean Water Act. So that is the brief version of what Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania does. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague at Penn Future, Ezra Thrush. Thanks, Katie. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ezra Thrush. I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs with Penn Future. Uh, we do a lot of work in Harrisburg. I'm the day-to-day -day eyes and ears on the ground for the organization. Uh, basically, the chief lobbyist for our organization working closely with the legislators and the executive branch agencies and the governor's office. Uh, I'm based in Harrisburg. We're in and out uh, influencing policy and legislation uh, daily, making sure that we move forward good environmental policy and we do defense against bad, uh, bad bills that move to roll back regulations or make our air or water uh, dirtier. And we're also trying to move forward some good uh, clean energy and climate legislation as we can. So uh, we're actively involved with the legislature, really excited to be here tonight with everybody and uh, really, uh, really a huge, big, big amount of thanks to the legislators who are joining us tonight. So thank you everybody. Thanks Ezra. Before we really dive into things, I did wanna lift up some of the current events that are important to both of our organizations. Penn Future and Conservation Voters applaud the jury's decision yesterday um, to convict Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. While that verdict was being read, a young black woman was killed by police in Ohio. At the core of our work is justice, that we must stop the powerful entities whose pollution hurts less powerful members of their communities. And we have to hold them accountable for their actions. Though our organizations primarily work for a healthier environment, we are all engaged in a fight for a just nation that puts the needs of its people over the needs of the powerful. And we are advocating for a system that holds the powerful to account, whether they wear blue uniforms or the corporate suits of those who pollute our waterways. I did just wanna share that with all of you. Um, it has been an interesting time in the news and these are our organizational statements, so thank you. Um, I also, in terms of thank yous, would like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, uh, Choose Clean Water, Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed and the Audubon Mid-Atlantic. So again, our co-sponsors, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. So with that, um, I want to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Um, I believe they are on here somewhere. There's a whole bunch of you. So thank you for joining us. But our first speaker talking primarily about lead tonight is State Representative Mike Schlossberg. Uh, he was previously employed by the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce. He is currently the Democratic Caucus Administrator. He's right in the Lehigh Valley where we have our wonderful field organizer, Maria, doing some work. And I'm going to pass it over to Representative Schlossberg. 
Thanks so much, Kate. And hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I cannot wait. <laughs> you know what? There's a lot I can't wait for, but let me start by stating the obvious. I can't wait until I don't have to sit in my basement office and talk to all of you today because I am so sick of dressing casually for events. I'm tired of wearing sweaters. I may or may not be in pajama bottoms right now. I'm in pajama bottoms right now, and I'm tired of it. So I sincerely look forward to getting back in person with all of you. Uh, I have the honor of serving the people of the 132nd District, which is portions of the city of Allentown and South Whitehall Township. As part of that, and, I, and let me add a little bit to what Katie was just talking about. I, I, it's funny, I was actually thinking about this earlier this morning. It's been really remarkable for me over the past, and I'll say four or five years, it's not that you were ever unaware of the factors that racism, that systemic racism and that societal inequities played, but it's become very interesting how that's really been thrust into the spotlight among people like myself, candidly, who I like to consider myself an ally of those causes. But it's, to be candid, the past few years have really been a reawakening for me as we talk more about equity and viewing policies through an equity framework. And to be honest, honest with you, lead is a great example. So we have serious challenges with lead in Allentown, as do quite a few of my colleagues. I know I see my colleague, Representative Sterling here from the city of Lancaster, and it's a challenge there as well. Lead isn't just an urban problem, but it's largely one. And that deals largely with the age of our housing stock. If you have housing stock that is, I want to say pre-1970, or if you are in pre-1970 for paint, but pre-1986 for things like lead pipes or fixtures or even some of the solder that we've used, lead can create huge problems. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but it can cause pretty significant physical, behavioral, and intellectual limitations on the life of a child in particular who may either breathe in lead, uh, lead smog or potentially even ingest lead paint chips. Now, bringing this back to Allentown, it's something that we've had challenges with, not just in our homes, but in our water infrastructure and in our schools, where there were some serious challenges with lead. I think most of the school issues have been abated, but the truth is that we have school buildings in the Lehigh Valley <clears throat> and in the city of Allentown in particular that date to the mid to late 19th century. I always cite this as an example. My wife teaches at Harrison Morton Middle School in the city of Allentown, which was built in 1871, otherwise known as when the Civil War more or less just ended. And it's really remarkable to think about the various environmental exposures that some of these kids have had. Now, bringing this back to what I was just talking about, the city of Allentown is a majority minority city. Typically, unfortunately, just like the rest of the nation, our residents of color are more likely to live in older, poor maintained housing stock, and again, housing stock that has more serious lead issues. This goes not only for residential properties, but for commercial ones as well. Even if a family is aware that there is lead in their home, they may not be able to pay for the mitigation. So it becomes incumbent upon us in the government to first conduct testing, conduct testing of people who live in homes and then assist with some of the mitigation efforts. We do okay with this in Pennsylvania, to be honest with you. And I'll explain why in a second. We have a safe and healthy homes program that publishes information on preventative measures <clears throat> that can be taken. The Pennsylvania Disease Surveillance System publishes specific reports on risk areas. It has consistently identified Allentown as one of the higher ones. In 2014, the legislature enacted the Lead-Free Act, which further decreased the percentage of lead allowed in public water systems. There have also been task forces and a variety of efforts to try to deal with this issue. Now, part of the reason we've had some success with it deals with the political alignment of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is largely a rural and agricultural state, and I would say that rural interests largely control the legislature. I don't mean that in a negative way, to be as clear as humanly possible. In fact, in a lot of areas, including education and mental health, Poor rural areas and poor urban areas have a lot more in common <clears throat> than we may realize. And that's why this is also an issue in a lot of rural areas. So what else can we do? Well, there have been a couple of policy proposals, things that I have either sponsored or co-sponsored. There was a piece of legislation last year that would have provided for mandatory screening for children at 12 and 24 months, monitoring of at-risk uh, at risk children and insurance coverage for the expected mothers and children who were under the age of six years old and had lead contamination. There's also legislation that requires daycares to test for lead and remediate any contamination in water, paint, dust, or soil. That's something. It's not enough, but it's something. And it's something that's particularly important in a place with older housing stock. Lead is a serious issue. It's an issue that 
really relates more than anything else to the age of some places infrastructure, not necessarily where they live, but the end result is that it hits our disadvantaged population the hardest, including a lot of people that live in my district and around it. Um, with that, I think Katie, it's time, my turn to shut up and turn it over to the next speaker, right? Okay, she's laughing, so I'm going to. You are correct. <laughs> All right. Well, quite well done on that timing. Cutting off, so I will be here until at least six fifty. I actually have to go on PCN Live uh, later today, where I'll be debating Representative Brad Roy. And if you know Representative Brad Roy, please call in and ask questions. For the love of God, I, I see you with a couple of headshakes. Rock on. All right, should time to shut up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Representative Ezra. Hey folks, I have uh, really a great pleasure of introducing our next uh, speaker, uh, Republican speaker from uh, Montgomery County, right outside of Philadelphia in the suburbs, uh, Representative Todd Stevens. Representative Todd Stevens is from the 151st district. I don't follow the district numbers too closely in Harrisburg, but I made sure to look that up for folks tonight. He's uh, from the North Wales area and uh, our colleagues from Penn Future and conservation voters that work in that region of Pennsylvania are Donna Kohut and Tom Cicino. Uh, but we're really excited to be here tonight with uh, and having Representative Todd Stevens uh, talk to us about uh, PFAS and water issues in his district there in suburban Philadelphia. So with no other with no further ado, uh, I'm going to kick it over here to Representative Todd Stevens. Thanks again, Rep. Stevens. Well, thanks so much, Ezra. I want to uh, just say thanks uh, thanks to you and all the other organizations hosting this event tonight. Um, water issues have become, you know, first and foremost in my district um, over the last 10 years or so. Um, I do want to let your folks know I've I'm on my way home from Harrisburg. I did pull over while I'm in my car. I'm no longer driving. I, I am pulled over and not moving. So, um, but I, you know, it's interesting. I came uh, into this issue of PFAS, um, you know, sadly, accidentally. My hometown is Horsham, Pennsylvania in Montgomery County. Um, it is home to the former Willow Grove Naval Air Station, which is um, about 800 acres of a former military site. And in 2014, sadly, we learned uh, that um, through years of training with firefighting foam at the Willow Grove Naval Air Station, our public water supply had been contaminated with a family of chemicals um, called PFAS. And, um, you know, PFAS is used in thousands of products that uh, we all have in our homes every day. Um, you know, if you eat microwave popcorn, it's used in the lining of the bags, um, Teflon pans, uh, you know, all the, uh, the non-stick stuff, um, you know, for, uh, for upholstery and clothing and, and all kinds of things. But um, one of the biggest areas that we're seeing all across the country, you know, we're not unique in this regard in Pennsylvania, but um, firefighting foam uh, contains these, uh, these chemicals. And unfortunately, when firefighters train, um, they use this foam and it goes out into the soil. And as I know, most of the folks on this call understand all too well, uh, when you leave chemicals in the soil and then the rain comes, um, you know, that, that water brings those chemicals down uh, ultimately into the aquifer and other water sources. And that's exactly what happened in Horsham, Pennsylvania, and also in Warminster at the, uh, the former uh, Johnsville, the, the former Naval Air uh, Development Center over there. And um, they experience, are experiencing a lot of the same issues. Now they're, um, a little bit differently situated because they already redeveloped that piece of land. Um, in Horsham, the redevelopment of that 800 acres has been delayed while the federal government tries to figure out how to remediate and clean up the site. Um, literally at this point, they are operating uh, these, these pump and treat systems where they literally pull water out of the aquifer, they treat it with uh, carbon filters or resin filters, and then put it back down into the aquifer, uh, you know, without the PFAS in it. And that's, you know, the main solution. They have hauled hundreds of tons of soil uh, off of that property uh, in an effort to try to remove it so that it's no longer leaching into the aquifer and our, our other water sources. Um, stormwater runoff has been a, a continual issue that we're dealing with. Um, and, and as I said, this issue reared its head in, in 2014. Interestingly, back then there was a, um, a federal standard of about 600 parts per trillion that was deemed, um, you know, the, the level that that uh, you know folks were concerned about. In um, in 2015 or 16, uh, that level dropped to what is the current standard of 70 parts per trillion, 
Um, most experts say that 70 parts per trillion is not an adequate standard. And I want to tell you, some of the local communities have really led the way um, in trying to deal with this issue and adopted a non-detect standard. So, um, you know, Horsham Township, uh, my, uh, Warminster Township and Warrington Township, uh, Warminster and Warrington are in Bucks County, right, uh, right across the street there. Um, they have all adopted uh, non-detect standards, which are the highest standards in the country um, for, for water. And so uh, they really led the way, but the challenge became, how do you get there? When you have all this stuff in your water, it costs money to remove it. Um, the solution is through filters. Back then uh, in 2016, it was carbon filters. Um, now there's some evolution on that and we're moving over to a resin product that uh, lasts longer and uh, can be recharged and things like that. So, um, you know, this technology continues to evolve, but all this costs money. And uh, back in 2016, I remember getting a call from the township manager and he says, all right, you know, you led the, led the calls for a non-detect standard. We adopted it, but now we have to figure out how to fund the efforts to get there. And um, fortunately, partnering with Governor Wolf, who has been a terrific partner in PFAS remediation across Pennsylvania, um, we were able to secure $10 million. We had 10 contaminated wells in Horsham. We needed 10 filters, and uh, they're about a million bucks a piece. So we were able to do that, um, you know, with a, a one-time infusion of cash. Um, and uh, and I know recently, uh, PennVest also just uh, provided another capital infusion of cash into um, uh, into a neighboring community down in uh, in Upper Dublin, the Abington, Upper Dublin area. So um, you know, we continue to to try to fund these remediation efforts. One of the things that the legislature did, uh, and Governor Tom Wolf signed it uh, into law back in November of 2019, um, was to create a new authority, which I chair down here um, in, uh, in Montgomery County. We have members from Bucks and Montgomery County that are on the authority. And this is the first and only dedicated funding stream in Pennsylvania that's dedicated just to PFAS remediation. Um, last year, it generated about $15 million um, was diverted to uh, clean water and infrastructure projects uh, down here, focusing in on PFAS. And so, um, you know, we just uh, just the other day helped fund a, uh, a new water tower that North Wales Water Authority is building uh, that will help them uh, move PFAS free water throughout their uh, their service area. So um, funding has been really important. We did stand up this program. It's, um, you know, just a little over a year old. It's working out really well. We've uh, had a lot of successful projects thus far. and um, in the end, um, PFAS is sadly something that I think uh, most of America is going to learn about sooner or later uh, because it's so prevalent. They're called forever chemicals for a reason, and um, you know they're very difficult to, to deal with. And um, I did I did fail to mention I see Ezra popped on, so I know I've got to wrap up here. But I just want to mention one thing. You know, some of the health effects that we're dealing with um, these have been linked to cancer. Um, I do have a request in this year's budget to allow some further study on the links between cancer and PFAS. So um, it's an evolving subject and we'll keep you posted and I'll keep working with all the, all the groups that are hosting this call tonight to continue to address PFAS across Pennsylvania. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much for all your work, uh, Representative Stevens, really, uh, really champion uh, of the issue and we're eager to continue working with you. Uh, thanks again for your time tonight and safe, safe travels back to, uh, to the southeast there. Uh, thanks for your work in Harrisburg. Katie, I'm gonna kick it back over to you for our next introduction. Take it away, Katie. Yes, thank you, Ezra. Our next speaker is Representative Patty Kim. Since we are doing district numbers, I'm like Ezra sometimes when in Harrisburg, we don't always think of district number, but it's the 103rd district serving Dauphin County, um, the Harrisburg area. Representative Kim is a former news reporter and anchor and a former Harrisburg City Councilwoman. And she is currently helping to lead the charge on several initiatives, including the Fight for 15 and some other good things. So I'm gonna kick it over to Representative Kim, excuse me, Kim, um, to talk a little about stormwater. Yes, Katie, thank you so much for having me tonight. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, so I live next to the Susquehanna River uh, in Harrisburg. I'm on Second Street and I worry about flooding and what goes into that river. Forecasters are predicting another rainy summer and that means more stormwater. 
As we all know, stormwater carries an enormous amount of pollution, including sediment, car oil, lawn fertilizers, pesticides, pet waste, and cigarette butts. And as you might expect, this has many negative impacts on our streams and rivers. So in Harrisburg, the sewer and stormwater system are combined, meaning when heavy storms cause pipes to overflow, sewage, waste, and pollution runs out into the Susquehanna River and other water sources. In 2018, seven samples from City Island Park Beach and along the riverfront, um, among other places, places had E. coli at more than 10 times the safe levels. Uh, lower Susquehanna River Keeper said that out of all the cities in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Pennsylvania, Harrisburg has the most coming out into the river as far as untreated water, wastewater. Uh, water authority records show that the amount of human waste mixed with stormwater released in the Susquehanna increased from 789 million gallons in 2016 to 1.4 billion in 2018. And before my colleagues start to judge me, the waste that comes out of the Capitol also goes into, I'm kidding. <laughs> Everyone is participating in the, uh, the sewage issue, okay? So um, in response to these issues, many municipal governments have found themselves unable to raise the funds needed to provide necessary infrastructure improvements. Um, they have resorted to imposing stormwater fees to solve this problem, putting a larger financial burden on residents and municipal governments. Large businesses like apartment complexes will have much larger fees adding um, and creating more economic stress to other local businesses. Now, Katie has impeccable timing because this is what was announced today. Capital Region Water, which is the water utility company that services Harrisburg, uh, was approved a couple of days ago for a $21 million loan from PennVest. Yay! The low interest loan will help fix and replace aging sewer pipes and associated manholes, as well as installing a new stormwater system. This is great news. This will not only prevent pollutants going into the river, but it will keep our water uh, rates down, especially in my impoverished area um, in the city of Harrisburg. Now, not all municipalities can obtain a loan like this. And that's why I'm so grateful for Biden's Americans job plan, um, which will um, be beneficial to upgrading and modernizing our stormwater systems. And I am reading from the plan um, on the website and it says aging water systems threaten public health in thousands of communities nationwide. President Biden will modernize these systems by scaling up existing successful programs, including by providing 56 billion with a B in grants and low cost flexible loans to states, tribes, territories, and disadvantaged communities across the country. President Biden's plan also provides $10 billion in funding to monitor and remediate PFAs in drinking water and to invest in rural small water systems and household well and wastewater systems, including drainage fields. Uh, I definitely want to see this plan passed. We need to make sure that our uh, congressmen and U.S. senators um, help pass this because it will improve um, our, the quality of um, our water system and provide new jobs, which we need. With that, I'm going to end. And thanks again for having me, guys. Thank you so much, Representative. I am going to kick it over to Ezra for our next guest. Thank you, Katie. Uh, we're going to stay in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, but we're going to travel down the Susquehanna a little bit to Lancaster County. Uh, imagine, if you will, we're all in a canoe together, uh, uh, traveling the lower Susquehanna. Uh, Lancaster County is near and dear to my heart. I have a lot of family who live there, and I know a lot of us have been there and enjoy enjoy the farmland. And uh, Lancaster City, of course, is really exciting. So it's uh, my big joy to introduce our next legislator uh, from the city of Lancaster and Mainheim Township. And I think Lancaster Township, if I'm right, Rep Sterla. Uh, yeah, I tiny, to... tiny bits of all those <laughs> places outside the city, but basically yeah. the city. I give you Representative Sterla, a longtime advocate on water issues in the State House. So everybody, uh, Representative Sterla from the 96th Legislative District. Thanks. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. Uh, as was pointed out, uh, you know, we're the Conestoga runs through the city of Lancaster, uh, deposits into the uh, Susquehanna River and then into the Chesapeake Bay. I am a member of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, have been for years. Um, point out that uh, my score with uh, environmental voters and environmental scorecards throughout the years, I, I've been in the legislature for more than three decades and 
my score is averaged between 95 and 100 every year. So um, the, uh, I'm also a member of the Blue Green Caucus and we've talked about the fact that um, in some, at some cases, and, and the Blue Green Caucus tries to work with organized labor and uh, on environmental issues. Uh, sometimes the organized labor is at odds with the environmental community, particularly when it comes to energy issues and Marcella shale and drilling and those kinds of things. But the one place where we have a lot of common ground, I mean, there is like no discrepancy is on water. And the, the water issues, I think, are something that, that we can across the board, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, pro-labor, anti-labor, it, water, water works for everyone. Um, I want to make two quick comments about what my previous uh, uh, legislator, the previous legislators had said, and then I'll talk about uh, a water bill that I have. Um, in Lancaster, if you are a child in Lancaster, you are three times more likely to get lead poisoning than if you live in Flint, Michigan. And that's not because of the water pipes, it's because of the fact that all the housing is pre-1978 and has lead paint in it. Um, so I have a bill that does uh, would require lead testing in all rental properties. Right now, as a landlord, uh, you have to say whether, when you're renting a property, whether or not you know of a lead hazard. Um, as a landlord myself, I know that I can always answer that honestly because I've never had my properties tested. Now, I was a former contractor, so I removed the lead from those, so I know they don't. But I could, whether I knew the lead was there or not, I could honestly say I don't know because I've never had it tested. This would require the testing of all those rental properties um, and I believe would get us to the point where we need to be in terms of just even identifying what properties have lead in them and what, which ones don't. Um, I think it's a perfect uh, use of some of the uh, stimulus money that's coming, uh, particularly around infrastructure, some one-time dollars that could clean up a whole lot of lead in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, in terms of the PFAS, uh, Senator Yaw has introduced the bill in the House and I'm introducing, or in the Senate, I'm introducing the bill in the House. We have a bill that uh, is supported by firefighters that uh, takes the PFAS out of the training foam. So it doesn't take the PFAS out of the foam that actually gets used to fight real fires, but they train about a hundred times for every fire that they actually go fight. And so we can significantly reduce the PFAS, uh, particularly in those training sites uh, and the firefighters are happy about that also because they're exposed to it every time they train. Um, now to my bill re relating to water, um, it is House Bill 20. And the way you can remember it is House H and 2020, so H2O, it's a water bill. Um, and uh, what it does is uh, right now in the state of Pennsylvania, if you take more than 10,000 gallons of water a day, from the waters of Pennsylvania, which are owned by the people of Pennsylvania, unlike coal rights or shale rights or gas rights or anything else, water rights are owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the people of Pennsylvania. So if you take 10,000 gallons or more of the water from waterways or wells in Pennsylvania, you have to file with DEP and tell them that you're taking more than 10,000 gallons a day for 30 or more consecutive days of the people that already report that. Now, once you do that, you don't have to pay for the water. You just have to tell them you're taking the water. Once you do that, they, they, they have that, those records. Currently, there is between eight and nine billion gallons of water a day that is taken from the waterways of Pennsylvania for free. So we are selling a re go, go west of the Rockies somewhere and ask somebody whether they'll give you water for free and watch them laugh at you for hours on end. Um, we give away water in the state of Pennsylvania like it's not worth anything. And it is worth a lot. So, but the fact that we give away 9 billion gallons a day means that you don't need to charge people a whole lot for it. So my legislation proposes that if you take a gallon of water and keep it, you pay one tenth of one cent per gallon to take the water and keep it. If you take the water, use it to wash potatoes, 
and then put it back in the river, you pay one one hundredth of a cent to be able to use the water that is a resource from the state of Pennsylvania. That generates about 350, actually generates about $385 million a year. So when you're talking about funding water projects, and, and what it also does is says that we're going to use that money strictly to fund water projects, and that the projects that are going to get funded are, are based on the amount that's generated in each watershed in the state of Pennsylvania. You can also, it allows for bond issues. So it would allow um, uh, PennVest, which is gonna manage the money to do bond issues. If you took $360 million and turned that into a bond issue today, you can do about $6 billion worth of water projects in the state of Pennsylvania. Now, Alcasan, the, the sewer authority in Allegheny County, is under EPA order to do a $3 billion cleanup. The, the Susquehanna River Basin is under EPA order to do a $3 billion cleanup. The Delaware River Valley has excessive uh, stormwater issues. So even at $6 billion, we still wouldn't be funding everything, but it's six billion dollars worth of projects more than we're funding today, and we're not talking about putting anyone out of business. I mean, this is a extremely fair thing to say. You're only going to pay one one hundredth of a cent per gallon. I mean, you look at the tanker trucks that go by on the roads, and they're you know twelve hundred gallons. It's it costs somebody an extra couple of bucks. Um, it's it's not. And, and this is not after going after any one industry. In fact, the industry that uses the most is the electric utility generation industry. And in order to not pick winners and losers within the electric utility generation industry, the amount of water that's used by the electric utility generators would generate about 220 million of that 385 million. And so uh, coincidentally, they generate about 220 million megawatts of electrical energy every year and ship about 25% of it out of state. So what I'm doing is just saying you have to pay an extra buck a megawatt for what you generate. And I checked with the, the PJM grid and they said, you know, at, at a rate at the time I checked with them, they said the rate was about $40 a megawatt and going to $41 a megawatt would not make anybody uncompetitive in the PJM market. Um, and so Literally, without anybody noticing what's happening, you could do about $6 billion worth of water projects a year. And that's what I'm pushing with House Bill 20. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Representative Sterl. I really appreciate your, your work over all the many years on water issues, really, uh, really pushing hard on these, on these issues. Um, I'm going to kick, kick it back over to my colleague, uh, Katie, for the next, uh, the next speaker. Yes, um, we are waiting on uh, Representative Sarah Inamorato. She is driving back from Pittsburgh. And if you have ever driven west on the turnpike, you know there are tunnels. So she's trying to join us. I see she has not joined, but she did share with me some points that she wanted to bring up. So. Let me first tell you a little bit about Representative Inamorato. Uh, she's of the 21st Legislative District. She is in Allegheny County. A lot of uh, the city of Pittsburgh is in her district, like the neighborhood of Lawrenceville. She grew up just north of the city and really believes in her middle-class roots and helping workers um, and the environment. If any of you are following some of her work, you will know that she is a proponent of adding regulations to polluters. So I'm also gonna ask Ezra to chime in if I miss something in some of these top lines since she has been unable to join us. Um, what she really wanted to talk about was health risks and water, particularly around fracking. One of her 
her pieces of legislation that she has been working on and trying to champion, especially for poisoned wells all throughout Western Pennsylvania and the Marcellus region is there are loopholes right now for hazardous waste and leachates that need to be closed. Um, we don't know where some of this waste ends up. We actually produce more waste in terms of a barrel of water, uh, more barrels of waste from this process than we do actual, for example, like a barrel of oil. Um, we've had to rely on private testing of some of these, these waters that are part of the, the fracking process. The properties of those waters, we know that they are toxic. We know that there are higher than average amounts of radioactive materials. And those radioactive materials occur naturally in the ground normally, but when you involve them in more of an industrial process, they become concentrated, et cetera, and that ends up in water. And some of you may remember other legislation from prior years, some of our great volunteers that I recognize on this call um, with legislation that happened previously where they might wanna put some of this water on roadways to keep down road dust on dirt roads. But this is not regulated. Representative Inamorado really wants to close these loopholes. She lifted up Dimmick is still without drinkable water. And there are injection wells that just put this waste right back in to potential water systems and it's still not required to be labeled toxic and it can further contaminate water sources that are already at risk. And the public is also not aware of a lot of this. There have been some studies done at the state level, but not enough extensive testing. So those are my talking points from Representative Inamorado. Um, I don't see Ezra on screen, so I feel like he may, do you have anything to add to the basics of Representative the representatives talking points? No, you did a great job, Katie. All uh, right. It's really exciting. I know that Rep. Amorado is leading the issues around fracking and water, mostly around the wastewater. So I think highlighting the, the leachate loophole and the radioactive waste loophole, I think that's great. So thanks, Katie. Yeah, no problem. And let's see, I do believe... We're going to hand it over to Ezra, who's going to give us a nice introduction for two videos we're going to, two short videos we're going to show you guys now. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Katie. Uh, folks, we had a couple legislators who would, who would have loved to have joined us tonight, but uh, they had other, they had other obligations tonight. So uh, I'm going to be introducing two videos here from uh, Representative Joe Webster from the 150th District, also from Montgomery County and Representative Joanna McClinton from the 191st uh, Legislative District. Representative Joe Webster is from the Collegeville, Skipac, West Norden area. Uh, his district is up against the Perkiomen River and the Schuylkill River. And, uh, and he's gonna talk about uh, a new bill that he's working on that tries to increase uh, the tree buffer uh, lengths along streams, creeks, and rivers uh, called forested riparian buffers. And he's, uh, he's trying to increase the, uh, the requirements on either side of, of stream banks. And then we have a video from Representative Joanna McClinton from Southwest Philadelphia and, and parts of Delaware County. And Rep Representative Joanna McClinton uh, just began this session year as, as the brand new leader for the House Democratic Caucus. And so she's going to talk generally about uh, water and uh, the House's uh, priorities and what, what clean water means to her district. And so without further ado, uh, Jess, if you want to hit play on the videos for Representative Webster and Representative McClinton. Happy to. And folks, uh, drop in the chat if this uh, if the audio isn't working for you. But give me one second and I will happily share my screen to first share with you a video from Representative Joe Webster. I wanna say thank you to Penn Future for having me on board. And I'm sort of chuckling a little bit. This is a Zoom call. So, so uh, unfortunately, I'm sending you a video but you might not know either way if I'm virtual or I'm a video, but here I am. Thanks for your time this evening and for letting me address uh, Penn Future and, and all the members 
and all the advocates and all those interested in doing great things for our environment because in Pennsylvania we need to. So I'll tell you quick about House District 150. We're just west of Norristown. So it's West Norriton, then Collegeville, Lower Providence, Upper Providence, and Skipback. And what is interesting to me about the district and relevant in terms of our discussion today is it's an older community with Ridge Pike and Main Street and Ridge Pike again and Main Street again as it goes through the municipalities as an old urban Main Street with old infrastructure and sort of a industrial touch and feel kind of look. And, and mixed in left and right of that are enormous watershed properties. You know, we have Evansburg State Park, uh, which borders the Skip Back for uh, over 17 miles of the Skip Back Creek. And we have the Norristown Farm Park, and we have the James, uh, John James Audubon Sanctuary. And that leads right into Valley Forge National Park, which borders on our south, south side. So we have this mix of industrial old infrastructure and very important greenways. And so the first thing I'll tell you about that is, you know, dramatic, and, and you know this. When, when we have storms today, they're somehow different. It, it really is climate change. It really is, uh, you know, higher and, and more powerful rainstorms, higher levels of water that are getting into these watersheds faster than they ever did before. And so we've had major flooding, we have major erosion on those creeks, we have water quality issues when those creeks, and, and the Perkyoman Creek in particular and the Schuylkill River are used as outtakes for, for tap water, for our, our water services. So one of the things that I'm interested in doing, and, and with Penn Futures help and, and the entire environmental community, and Penn Environment and Delaware River Keepers and, and the watershed basin communities, in particular the Perk Yeoman Watershed Conservancy, is I've introduced House Bill 714, which is a riparian buffer bill that simply attempts to protect the, the left bank and the right bank of every waterway in Pennsylvania. I'm State Representative Joe Webster, enjoying a fantastic day in the Narstown Farm Park, right here at the Stony Creek, Stony Creek, <laughs> as an example of what a riparian buffer should be. Riparian meaning that land left and right of the creek. And, and what you can see around us is plants, grass, and, and uh, bushes and trees that absorb the water on its way to the creek. And that's important. It's part of a riparian buffer bill that would protect Pennsylvania's streams, creeks, rivers, our lakeways, and sometimes just a little drainage ditch and make sure that the water you see in the creek is clean as possible. Pennsylvania cares about clean air and clean water. It's part of our constitution. You have the right to clean air and clean water. And this is a good step in that direction. I'm also in Harrisburg this week, which unfortunately is one of the reasons I can't be with you today in virtual. <laughs> Um, so I was looking for something that's really not a good riparian buffer. But if you look the other way, I couldn't help thinking, but thinking, that this isn't too bad for an urban environment. This concrete trail could be permeable, should be permeable. But all in all, here on the Susquehanna River today, even as I look across this, the river, there are trees, there's a buffer. We could do better, but this isn't bad. So we have to look for a, a uh, more troubling example, and I'll leave that to you for another day. Today, maybe we can celebrate Earth Day. We can celebrate Penn Future and our vision for a better planet and, and, uh, <laughs> and simply uh, celebrate rather than uh, criticize today. So I hope you don't mind, you know, that little diversion to the creek, just, just because on a Zoom call it helps sometimes to, 
to break the monotony of, uh, of me sitting here in a tie and, and just talking. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not available for questions after this, which, of course, is where I would excel. <laughs> but, but you get the point. There's good and bad to the current infrastructure. Sometimes it's just because our infrastructure is old, and we don't necessarily need to point fingers. We just need to create water programs and environmental initiatives to fix it for the future. One example that still resonates with me is that tro Tropical Storm Isais created a 20-foot storm surge along the creeks and rivers that I just mentioned. The debris left behind, the uh, big trees, the erosion along the banks, you know, the plastic that was hanging from limbs and trees and, and left behind was enormous. And, and we simply have to slow down that water. It needs to enter our watershed in a more natural way, filtered by the, the greenways, filtered by the roots, you know, the grasses, the trees, and, and then in a, in a much uh, safer way enter the watershed. So a lot of things for us to consider. I'm proud to have, have sponsored House Bill 714. I hope that, that you all uh, can get behind that and help us push it along. Um, and then, and then see where that goes. And, and in the interim, I'll close by saying, this is just one step. You know that there's a lot of pieces of this together, and and we're we're still in a pandemic. We're still in a crisis mode from safety perspectives. We've had, you know, we've had a lot of stress and strain in our economic world. And so I'm one of those people who see these environmental programs, some of uh, water infrastructure. Uh, as part of, call it a new Green Deal, but an effort to create environmental benefits and, and charge the economy at the same time. And, and I frankly believe that's possible. I want to say thanks again to everyone at Penn Future, to Mr. Ezra Thrush for including me, and hope each of you have a, a, a safe evening, a, a better tomorrow, and a green future. Thanks. Great, and now we would love to show you all a video from Representative Joanna McClinton. Even for all those who are coming tomorrow. Even though we cannot meet in person, I'm so happy we can connect virtually and I can share with you some of the House Democratic Caucus's priority to move Pennsylvania forward. No matter what our political affiliations are, there are so many areas of agreements that all of us share. It comes down to one thing that we all want, clean drinking water, no matter where we live in the Commonwealth or what our voter registration card says. Nothing matters more than clean water. When you turn on the tap, water should be clean and safe to drink. That's everything that matters. Just ask our neighbors in Texas who suffered through the winter storm without water or the people in Flint, Michigan, who were poisoned by their own spigots. We believe in investing in tourism and in regulating agriculture to protect our farmers and our water. We can afford to do both of these things. Last year's farm bill was key in protecting rivers like the Susquehanna and the Delaware and where that water ends up in our homes. The Conservation Excellence Grants helped farmers use best management practices and provided grants, loans, and tax credits to build their economic future while protecting our environment. This year, the Delaware is being protected from fracking and we are making strong investments in the Department of Environmental Protection and DCNR to give the tools needed to protect our waterways and making sure that all of our businesses can thrive while we're protecting the river. This year, the budget plan includes big increases for agriculture pollution abatements and the, Ches the Chesapeake as part of an increased investment in protecting our air, our water, and all of our green space. 
As the climate keeps changing and flooding becomes more of an issue, we're going to need to do our part to help manage our natural resources. I was very proud to stand with Governor Wolf and create a plan to address flooding in southeastern Pennsylvania, both in Philadelphia and in Delaware County. When sometimes it rains so much, neighbors are instantly concerned as to whether or not their homes will be safe. We're working with the state to develop a broad, real solution that will help folks for land use, for planning, for stormwater management. It's all about preventing flash floods in the city and an overwhelming system that leads to polluted water downstream. I'm also so proud to stand and call for real investments to pay to fix the flooding issues, starting with the severance tax on natural, natural gas drillers. For too long, they've been taking advantage of the state and taking money and running with it. We're not trying to legislate them out of business at all, but we do understand that we should be partners with the people and in every state that surrounds the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania where natural gas is available, whether we're talking about West Virginia or the states a little bit farther away like Alaska and Texas, they pay one there, so why not pay one to our Commonwealth? The work that Penn Future is doing with Green City, Clean Waters Plan, it is absolutely vital. We can address climate change on the state level and advocate to our federal lawmakers to do something about this in Washington. We can create jobs and protect homes and businesses with smart stormwater strategies, building more livable cities in the process. With agriculture and tourism being such huge industries and clean water being at the heart of both, we cannot afford to let bad things happen. Now you might ask, what has the General Assembly done about this? Well, let's start with the Pennsylvania Farm Bill. It was a very large bipartisan effort and an achievement. Joining Reggie is a major step to protect our clean air because a lot of people in the real world might not understand how much current pollution is driven by generating energy. We need to make sure that we drive out billions of dollars in federal COVID relief for small businesses, for schools, for nursing homes, as well as providing substantial assistance for renters and homeowners who are struggling to keep roofs over their heads in this unprecedented public health pandemic. We're looking to invest federal dollars the right way when it comes to protecting our clean air, our clean water, and all of our green spaces. We're looking to invest $50 million in promoting clean energy, growing high-tech, high-wage jobs of the future. Now that our unions are in traditional fossil fuel jobs and embracing investments in clean energy, we can do even more to promote this growing industry. We can achieve energy independence and create jobs while protecting all of our natural resources. Certainly, there has to be so much more work to be done and continuing to navigate this new reality. But I'm encouraged by the work that we've done together to help give some relief to people that are struggling. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to address you. And until we can meet in person, let's make sure that we're taking care of our planet, not just for us today, but for all those who are coming tomorrow. Those were great videos. Um, I am personally very grateful for Representative Webster and Leader McClinton for sending those in. Um, I know we are approaching an hour here very quickly. Um, Ezra and I are willing to stay on a little bit longer, but we do have a surprise. Representative Sarah Inamorado has been able to join us. She has safely navigated the turnpike and its wonderful tunnels in Western PA. Um, I already introduced her, but I did message her that we are happy to give her a minute or two. If there is something that I missed in the talking piece. Hi, thank you so much, Katie, and thanks, Ezra, for um, inviting me to participate tonight. And thank you for covering my talking points um, while I was driving on the turnpike through the snow, right? And as we um, continue to burn fossil fuels the way that we do, we're going to continue to see this level of climate weirdness. Um, but one of the things I love to do when I'm driving on the turnpike, um, well, since Katie and Ezra talked about the, the, the talking points of our um, 
Bill, I, I want to share with you something I was thinking while I was driving. So one of the things I like to do is listen to podcasts. And I was listening to this one, Future Perfect. And it was a discussion between two women, this one um, scientist who did a study, um, Kimberly Nicholas, in the study showed that the, the best way, uh, it's a 2017 study, the best way to um, reduce your carbon footprint is not to have children. And they had a discussion on, on what that meant um, and what it meant to have a child now. And I think that's um, something that a lot of people my age um, who's in their 30s and haven't had children yet but would like them one day, it's something we have to consider now. We have to consider what kind of world are we um, bringing our children into and, and will we have a world to bring children into if we don't actually aggressively address climate change. And one of the things that came up in their discussion was being a good ancestor and trying to think about how do we um, stop thinking about the short term and think about the world that not only we're leaving our children, but their children and the children after them um, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the greatest things that we can do right now um, is leave fossil fuels in the ground. Um, and that's important for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. right? For our air quality, for our health and well-being, but it's also extremely necessary for our um, the quality of our water and being able to preserve that life-giving thing um, for ourselves, for our neighbors, but also our future generations. And you know, the more we invest in pulling that um, fossil fuels out of the ground, the more waste we generate. And we think about um, waste that we produce in our household. And we've been really, um, a lot of us have been really conscious on how we reduce, we reuse and recycle. Um, and we need to also, as legislators, think about this industry that's been so, um, that's so powerful and so ever present in, um, throughout our, our region, um, throughout our commonwealth. Um, what's, what are they doing with their waste? Um, who's responsible for it? Who's bearing the burden of it? Um, and I'll tell you right now um, that it's not the industry, but rather it's municipal budgets. Um, it's the health of our neighbors. And ultimately it's gonna be um, our ecosystems that, that pay the price of not having strong enough regulations um, that require the industry to clean up after themselves. Um, so that's really what our bills aim to do. Um, we have two <coughs> co-sponsorship memos, memos out. Um, we're always asking reps to sign on to, and hopefully we'll have, if anyone is on this representing an organization, we'll have an organizational letter that you can sign on to, as well as a series of one pagers that um, you can help educate your membership on um, the issue of radioactive oil and gas waste and how it in negatively impacts our environment, our health and our water. And um, I just wanna be um, grateful and, exp um, and express my gratitude for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate it and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you representative and kick it over back to our field director, Jess. Thanks so much, Katie. And yeah, Representative, so glad that you could join us. And thanks so much for the initiative that you take in being such a leader and protecting our environment. So folks, uh, we're really grateful that you spent your Earth Day Eve with us and we wanna get to your questions. But first I wanna share a few quick ways that you can get involved, especially to help push all of the great solutions and strategies we heard tonight forward. And so first of all, first things first, you've heard from some legislators tonight, but they might not be yours. You should take a look at the link that my colleague Michael just dropped in the chat Conservation Voters of PA with our community partners scores our legislators every year on how they vote on the environment. Words are great, but votes matter more. Are they voting for the environment when the hard choice shouldn't be a hard choice when the choice comes to their desk? And so take a look, um, check out that link. 
Also, um, at Penn Future and CVPA, we both uh, love to empower citizens and connect you with your legislator so that you can voice your concerns uh, and hear what they're working on as well. And so my colleague will drop a link in the chat about our advocate for advocates for the conservation and the environment team, our ACE team. And we would love for you to sign up if you're interested in meeting your legislators with us. Let us know, drop a, fill out that form at that hyperlink and we will call upon you when we've got a meeting with your state senator or state representative. Also, we love to stay in touch. So Michael's dropped it before, but we know that y'all lead really busy lives and there are hundreds of bills. The legislators on here can attest hundreds of bills that get introduced every month. And so we work day in and day out to keep our eye on it and we will let you know. So we want you to sign up for our action alerts um, by filling out any action. You'll be kept on the loop on future ones and we'll let you know when there's great legislation that was mentioned tonight that needs your help to move forward or when dangerous legislation needs your opposition. Additionally, uh, ways to keep in touch with us. If you're on Facebook, there is a Facebook group that you can join with fellow activists. And lastly, I want to wish all of you a really, really happy Earth Day. And if you'd like to join us tomorrow evening, Penn Future, is hosting a book talk. Perhaps you've heard of former representative Franklin Curry. If not, you know him through his work. He helped us to gain our environmental rights amendment in our constitution. Pennsylvania is one of two states that has it. And he has written a book about that experience. We're gonna be talking with him tomorrow at 7 p.m. And we'd love to have you join us. Michael just dropped the link in the chat for you to sign up. Now, with that, we wanna to get to your questions and there are many of them. So like I said, thanks for joining. We are recording this. If you're unable to stay, we will make sure to send you the recording in the coming days, but I'm going to pass it back to my colleague Katie to kick off the question and answer section. Thanks again, folks. Thanks, Jess. Um, we do have a whole bunch of questions. I know that Representative Schlossberg was unable to stay past seven o'clock. Um, I'm hoping other legislators on this call right now um, might be able to uh, answer this. Um, if not, Ezra and I, we're, we're quite familiar with things. Um, to start, we spoke about lead first, and again, a lot of questions. Will there be more legislation to demand school testing? Is it possible to do something to increase the funding? to help the lower income communities and households that Representative Schlossberg was talking about. Um, what are some, some options you think could happen there with the current legislature? So. Uh, this is Representative Sterla. I'll, I'll chime in on this. Um, about uh, 28 years ago, I uh, made an acquaintance with the chief planner for the state of Maryland. And he invited me to come see the, uh, his offices in Annapolis. And I went and we were looking at a computer screen, which in those days was sort of an oddity in and of itself. And he showed me a GIS map of the city of Baltimore which identified every property that had a lead hazard. That was 28 years ago. We don't have anything like that in the state of Pennsylvania today. And so what we do is, and you know, in, in my local community, the way we deal with lead is when some child goes into the hospital with lead poisoning, we go back out and check and see where they live. So we're using children as canaries in the coal mine to identify for us where the lead is. I really think we just need to, look, it's, it's not that hard to do a lead test in buildings. It's not that hard to say, everyone needs to do that. And 
even if we don't say, uh, I get it that people are reluctant to do it because they go, oh my gosh, remediation would cost me $25,000. I'm not even trying to mandate that they remediate it. I just wanna know where it is because unless I know where it is, I'm gonna wait for kids to get lead poisoning to find out where it is. And I wanna know where it is. And I think there are a whole lot of people that will voluntarily remediate. And eventually those that don't, we can require that they remediate. But ultimately, if I never know where the lead is, it's hard for me to do any remediation if I'm just waiting for kids to get sick first. And that to me is an abomination that we wait for kids to get sick and have high levels of lead before we're willing to go do anything about it. I think we need to prevent it from happening. If, if a parent moves into a home that has, is renting and ha, the home has high levels of lead, they can at least know that they need to use extreme precautions in making sure that they clean regularly and wipe down surfaces and do those kind of things. If they have no clue that it's even there, all it's, I'm just waiting for that kid to end up with high levels of lead. That's that, and to me, that's all preventable. So that's just my two cents on it. Thank you, Representative. Ezra, over to you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I have another good question here lined up on funding. This is federal funding, but uh, I know all the state legislators are going to have an impact on how the federal funding trickles down to uh, municipal governments and counties. So maybe Representative Inamorado, if you wouldn't mind taking a, a stab at this question. Uh, you know, many folks know that President Biden has announced his large uh, American jobs plan. I just a few weeks ago, actually out in Pittsburgh, uh, which will greatly help out the states to bounce back uh, in a just green and clean way from the COVID recession. What can citizens do to impact the way the money from the American Jobs Plan is spent? And how can we make sure ben it benefits Pennsylvanians? What are the levers in spending and impacting the money around the American Jobs Plan and also the, uh, the American Rescue Plan money that's, that's out now? Well, I think in a lot of ways you guys are doing it right now. I always say I can't do my job as a legislator unless I have people who are willing to meet with me and share their stories about what's going on in their families, what's going on in their neighborhoods, and you know what they would like the priorities of this legislature to be. Um, so, you know, as uh, Jess was sharing that information on how to get involved, how to contact your representative to tell them that addressing the climate change in a, a just and equitable way is where you want these monies to go. Um, they need to hear from you. Um, you know, one call is great. Um, one person and taking action is awesome. If you can bring your neighbor, it's even better. Um, but when we actually form a big coalition and have a collective voice, that's when we can make change and we can put pressure on the people in power um, to uh, make sure that these funds are allocated in a way that is gonna help us see a more sustainable and just um, future. And that's, that's really what you can do. Um, you know, I know as, a demo, as the Democratic, Democratic Caucus, we put together kind of what a Pennsylvania rescue plan can look like. Um, I can drop a link in there. Um, that's a good template to look at and say, hmm, is there enough on here that will address the needs um, of uh, the climate crisis that we're up against right now in Pennsylvania? And um, you, can, you can use that as a starting point conversations uh, with your representative, um, but please use your voice and bring as many people along as you can. Thanks, Rep. Back to you, Katie. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the next question, we'll just bounce between our two remaining legislators. Um, Representative Sterla, um, we kind of put together some of the stormwater questions but a big thing that came up was stormwater user fees. Is this something that will become a state practice versus local municipalities? Um, could it be a way to counter the high degree of hardscaping that is in a lot of industrial or urban expansion? 
Yeah, I, I think it can and I think it will. Uh, I know in Lancaster, we have a uh, stormwater fee. Um, the, the thing that I have been concerned about is that um, it's much easier to implement a fee if you just say everybody pays the fee. You've got X amount of hardscape. There you go, you pay the fee. Um, what has been the hard part is to say, okay, if I mitigate my hardscape, if I do rain barrels, if I do, uh, if I do a uh, catch basin underneath my uh, parking lot, if I do those kinds of things, will you reduce my stormwater fee? And to date, what they've said is, well, we don't know that you're gonna maintain it. It's hard for us to go you know, monitor this. So we're just gonna keep charging you the same fee. Well, that doesn't mitigate the issue. And what I want is for those fees to start really reflecting exactly how much water is coming off of that site, because I can get my site to the point where it has zero water runoff. And if I do, I shouldn't have to pay that fee because I've spent a fair amount of money getting it to that point. Um, currently, that's not the case everywhere. And I think if, as we get more sophisticated with this, uh, I think we will do a better job of it. Um, but I know I've seen like, I had a guy come to me a couple of years ago with a system that uh, captured all rainwater and then uh, sprayed it back on the roof in the summertime so that it evaporated and cooled the roof. And, you know, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, you have a whole system laid out here. I mean, that's a pretty simple system. You put a big tank in somebody's basement and you do a little spray irrigation system on their roof. Um, but you would, get, you would get zero credit for that under most systems today because they would say, here's how much hardscape you have, even if you captured 100% of that. So uh, ultimately, I mean, I know like uh, Representative Kim talked about the amount of uh, stormwater effluent that uh, uh, Harrisburg puts back into the Susquehanna. I mean, Lancaster was putting a billion gallons of untreated effluent into the, the uh, Conestoga on stor during storm events. And what we've done is said, it would cost us about 300 or $400 million to mitigate that by using treatment and building another plant and building storage capacity and things like that. And instead we've said, if we build a green infrastructure, we can spend less money and capture more water and never have it get to the stream on the day of the big rain events so that, or never have it get to the stormwater system, which is a combined storm and sewer system uh, on the day of the big rain events. And we can prevent that billion gallons from ever entering the stream and also have rain gardens and flower beds and all sorts of great things going on in our city and so let's spend the money on that instead. And part of this has got to be a, a reimagination. I mean, I, I pushed with PennVest uh, several years ago to say, you can't just be funding hardscape. And they said, okay, we get it. And they started funding some green infrastructure and hopefully are moving more and more and more towards green infrastructure and funding green infrastructure because those projects are the ones that are going to serve us the best not the hard infrastructure, it's the, it's the green infrastructure. And I want PennVest to be investing hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in green infrastructure, as opposed to building another pipeline that directs the water right straight to the stream and dumps it directly into the river. Thanks, Representative Sterla. I'm going to ask our next question uh, back to Representative Inamorado. It's about drilling, too. So something that I know that Rep. Inamorado works on very, uh, very closely. Um, this is from one of our one of our attendees, Craig. He says, if you don't know, some families throughout Pennsylvania have lost access to clean water due to local gas drilling and have yet to be provided with any kind of secondary option to access water. Uh, how can we get the Commonwealth to put in some kind of permanent water replacement for families that are affected by, by gas drilling contamination 
And I wonder, Rep. Arado, if you have any other uh, any other legislation or any other thoughts, I guess broadly on water issues and uh, replacement issues of fracking. Well, I think um, I think that speaks to the broader political environment that we're in that prioritizes the short term profits of corporations over the long term health and safety and viability and sustainability of our communities. Um, and that's what we've seen, right? We've seen um, a big explosion of, uh, in our state and you know our regulations um, and the regulatory tools necessary to hold um, that industry accountable has been um, nothing short of lackluster. Um, and you know we saw that with the AG's report that came out this past year and you know there's um things that very explicitly um say that people have been wronged by the industry and there has been a failure of our regulatory agencies um to hold them accountable um now some of that has to do with the way that we fund the dp or the way that we do not fund the dp um in the general assembly and how our spending has risen um collectively well our spending on the dp has decreased um and and the same timeline um while oil and gas wells have exploded um across the shale region um so you know we really i think have to look at um reforming the regulatory environment looking at funding our regulatory agencies making sure that our regulatory agencies like the department of health and department of dep communicate with one another um and then you know how do we um, again, how do we make sure if this industry is going to operate in our backyards that they are held accountable and they have to foot the bill on the entire life cycle of the process of acting resources and else the public is going to have to pick up the bill. And I think in a number of cases, it might have been too long. And we do have to make sure that the, the injustices that have been put upon families in this Commonwealth, um, we need to do whatever we can to right, right that wrong. Hey, can I just do a quick follow up on what Representative Inamorado just talked about? Sure. Um, I, I was in a Chamber of Commerce forum a couple of years ago and somebody was complaining about the fact that they were had been waiting for like nine months to get DEP approval on something. And one of my uh, Republican colleagues said, well, that's why we just need to get rid of some of the regulations. And I asked the person that was concerned about the fact that they had waited nine months, whether they had issue with what the regulations were that they needed to meet. And they said, no. I think they're perfectly reasonable. I think they're good. I want everyone to do this kind of thing. I just don't want to wait nine months to get approval when I actually meet all the qualifications. And that is, to Representative Inamorado's issue, the fact that we haven't funded DEP and allowed for people to process this. And so the some colleagues are using that to say, well, then we just need to get rid of the regulations. How about if we just hire some DEP people to process the paperwork? The, the industry, in a lot of cases, these industries are willing to be good stewards, but we're making them say, I just give up. I'm not going to do it anymore because we we won't process the paperwork for them. I mean, that to me is is the the true uh, the crux of, of what needs to happen here is we people these industries have like you know community uh you know resource people and they have people that are looking at uh i mean major corporations have people that are looking at trying to do good community acts and when we just say well go ahead try and do that good community act we're just not going to give you the paperwork for nine months they finally throw up their hands and say fine then i'll stop doing it and, and so we have an opportunity if we just fund DEP to, to process the paperwork. We've gone from I don't, how many people over DEP? 800 to a couple hundred. Um, and, and you know, so their workload increased tenfold and we wonder why there's delays. Well, there it is. 
Thank you so much, uh, Representative Sterla and Anna Murado. Really appreciate it. Um, I do want to give a, a shout out. I don't think he's on the call. Um, he was earlier, but um, Conservation Voters Executive Director Josh McNeil had made mention to me um, privately in the chat. Um, there are some questions that people have been asking throughout this. So I just want to close out with the nature of our legislature. There's been a question about how do these bills get through committees? Um, both representatives just brought up, we have underfunded DEP and then complain when they don't do their work. Um, somebody else asked um, about various taxes. We've been talking about stormwater fees and other taxes. Um, so I do wanna lift up, particularly going back to what Jess had already said about ways to get involved talking to your legislator. There are people, even in this very hyper-partisan kind of world we live in, this 24 seven news and social media cycle that we often feel we live in. And by getting involved and reaching out, um, talk about what your issues are. My favorite example of that for people is I have a Republican state Senator and a Republican uh, state representative I am a local elected official and I just go to them, even though I might personally be of a different party and I just say, hey, I have a problem in my community. This is how it's affecting people in my life and in my community. And we've gotten some good work done um, through you know, getting PenVest loans and things like that. So think about what your story is that you wanna tell your legislator. And definitely look at the ACE program and the action alerts and the Facebook pages. Seems really hyper-partisan. If we don't talk to our legislators and keep having conversations like this, it's gonna stay the same. So there you go. Jess, any final words or are we good to go? I think we're good to go. I just wanted to make a note that you don't have to be an expert to join us in these meetings. What legislators need to hear is how this personally affects you. And our organization can help bring you up to speed on what you need to know. So don't let that hesitate. Don't let that prevent you uh, from joining us. I want to thank you all so much. Uh, and I know that on behalf of all of us, we wish you a very happy Earth Day. I hope you're able to get outside in the coming days to celebrate the very Thing that we're working to protect and keep your eyes on your email this is just the first of a series of webinars so we're excited to see you in the coming months we thank each of you for spending this after afternoon evening with us and a big thank you to the legislators that joined us and stuck around shout out to representative sterla and inamorado uh, we really appreciate it and we hope to see you all soon take care